So please give her a warm welcome to Mick Harper. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in this book, we, uh, we were addressing a problem that nobody really thinks about very much, which is uh, how in reasonably sophisticated societies, but where there is no literacy, how people know where to go, how to get about. Uh, imagine y your own problems if you had to get from your home this morning to here uh, with without maps, without atlases, without road signs. Uh, you probably wouldn't have made it. Uh, even if this is your fifth, sixth visit to Glastonbury, you probably wouldn't be able to do it just by memory. Uh, you wouldn't know which motorway exit to take. So, uh, and of course, <laughs> that's with roads. Imagine the Bronze Age where there are no roads, where every journey is going to be slightly different because the river's in spate, there's civil war has blocked off a bit of the countryside. So how do you know to get where you want to go? This is the scale of the problem. The European Bronze Age, imagine every single, every single bronze implement uh, used made, buried, in anywhere in Europe for this 2,000 years. Now, every single implement has got one thing in common. It's got 10 or 20% of tin. And that tin came from, from Devon and Cornwall. Uh, little tiny bits came from Cyprus, little tiny bits came from uh, northwest Spain, but 90, 95% of all Bronze Age tin came from the West Coast, uh, from the West Country. The question is, if you've got a bronze foundry, say, here in Lyon, or, or here in Birmingham, or, or you're making bronze cauldrons in Denmark, uh, how, does, how do you get your tin? How do you know how to get to the West Country? How does the West Country know where you are? Well, this is an immense puzzle, which nobody actually puzzles about. We came up with a solution in our book, uh, at least just for Britain, which is that you use stone circles. Stone circles are a combination of um, a, a compass and a roundabout. And you move from stone circle to stone circle via ley lines. And you know, there's slightly more to it. You'll have to read the book to find the full story. But that's essentially how you get about uh, in Britain. Uh, when you're going from ley line to ley line, you eventually uh, arrive at our very famous longest ley line, uh, the Michael line. Uh, this is not an arbitrary, remember most ley lines are fairly arbitrary because you, you choose for yourself where they start and where they end. But there's nothing arbitrary about the Michael line. The Michael line is the longest uh, land line you can draw anywhere across Britain. Uh, but the problem with the Michael line, now, it, it, all of us here probably, it's an article of faith that the Michael line exists. But remember, the rest of the world thinks it's complete hooey. They think this is a fantasy. Uh, and, and we haven't really got very far in proving its existence. Here, here are a couple of the problems. Now, here's why it's called the Michael line, because it aligns with all these places called Michael, and it runs through Avery. Uh, so uh, most people say, well, this makes no sense at all. Avery was built in 3000 BC. Uh, St. Michael, he's a Christian saint. He couldn't have turned up before sort of 500 AD. How can you have a system that combines these two things? Well, uh, we turn the problem on the head on its head and say, uh, no, no, this is a system that's used whenever, whenever there's no literacy. There's no literacy in 3000 BC. There's no literacy in 500 AD after the Romans left. So you use the same system. What you call the places on the system might change. Remember, who is St. Michael? Well, St. Michael is just a Christian version of, of um, what the Romans called Mercury and, and the Greeks called Hermes. And, Scandinavians called um, Woden, 
the Egyptians called Thoth, this is all the same character. Uh, so there's, uh, for us, there's, there's no particular difficulty. But now, the, the next problem is, is, is this. Here's the Michael line at the end of it. And uh, we always make a big thing about it, it, it running to St. Michael's Mount. But it doesn't. It, it, it does not align with St. Michael's Mount. In, in, in fact, uh, lots of ley lines don't particularly align with the points that we claim that they do. The enthusiasm is, oh yes, it, it runs through this, it runs through that. But if, you, if you're careful, you, you find that it doesn't. And, and this is no exception. Uh, so, skeptics would say, well, look, if it doesn't even align with St. Michael points, you've got nothing. You've got no maths, you've got nothing. But we say the opposite. We say, look, what is the probability uh, that, look, it, it's accepted on all sides that St. Michael's Mount is the chief tin exporting port of the Phoenicians. All the tin that went to the Mediterranean, that fueled the, the Bronze Age civilizations in the Mediterranean, uh, came out by St. Michael's Mount and, and came down here to, to, to the Mediterranean via the Atlantic. Uh, so we say, well, uh, what is the probability uh, that uh, you, you would have the chief the tin exporting port uh, right next to what we claim is the main navigational point? Remember, this is all tin. This is where the tin is produced. How do you find your way, if you've got a tin mine up here in Exmoor, how do you find your way to St. Michael's Mount? What you do is you you follow the, uh, the ley lines until it hits the main ley line, then you follow it down and you can't miss St. Michael's Mount. To us it doesn't matter whether the line runs through, you don't, this is not a pathway, this is a navigational system. So it doesn't matter to us whether it actually passes St. Michael's Mount, as long as you can't miss St. Michael's Mount. But the second bit about St. Michael's Mount, I, I want you to have a look at this because uh, the rest of this talk is, is, is gonna be it's going to turn on this factor. Now, to you, that probably looks pretty, touristy, rather nice. But look at it as completely bogus. <coughs> Think of it as, look, it's completely unnatural. Think of it as, look, it's a conical island sitting in a sand of sea, and it's right next uh, to the main uh, ley line. I'm not asking you to believe, but just open in your mind the possibility that this is a completely artificial island. And it's put there specifically to, uh, as the end point of the Michael line. And then that way you can have a look at some of the other conical islands that rise up in flat plains on the Michael line. You'll, you'll be completely familiar, especially with this one. Look, this is my first visit to Glastonbury. So I saw the Glastonbury tour for the first time yesterday, driving in. And I looked at it, I thought, how can anyone believe that that's a natural hill? It's obviously man-made. So, uh, uh, but as I said, we're, uh, we cannot now, I mean, look, the Michael line has been around for 50 years. Uh, we've been arguing about it for 50 years. There's nothing I can say to either substantiate or to reject it. What we've got to do is we've got to find another Michael line, uh, this time a Michael line with so much evidence on it that it can't be dismissed. And then by extension, we can start really looking at this Michael line. So that's what we're going to do. There's only one historical account of a prehistoric trade route and that's written by this guy, Theodorus Siculus, writing about 0 BC. The inhabitants of that part of Britain, which is called Valerian, Valerian is uh, Devon and Cornwall, prepare the tin, working very carefully the earth in which it is produced. The ground is rocky, but it contains earthy bones.